Welcome to the Tactics Meeting. I'm your host, Dan Smiley. Today on the program, we're going to be talking about emergency communications. Radios, repeaters, amateur radio, the list goes on and on. It's fascinating, and I hope you enjoy it. And it's all coming up right now. Today on the Tactics Meeting, we have Pete Pritchard. He is the regional manager for the response group in Alaska and the 101st group commander for the military auxiliary radio service. And he's here to talk to us about emergency radio communications. I've just recently begun to get into this. I'm now uh, licensed at the technician level. My call sign is Kilo Kilo 7 Charlie Alpha Victor. Uh, in all the podcasts I've been watching about amateur radio, everybody introduces themselves with their call sign. So they're out. They do. And congratulations. I'm KL7IS, Kilo Lima 7 India Sierra. So that's great. Pete, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks. Thanks. I've heard about it. And then when I got a call from you, I, I've, uh, I'm in a great company. There have been some people have been very generous with their time and have come on board and lent their expertise to this kind of backyard project. And I'm super thrilled with how people have received it. And I well, that's pretty cool. We've, we go way back. I mean, I remember sitting on uh, a couple old aluminum boats in the Puget Sound there uh, when we were working for co ops and. Uh, talking about big things and here we are here we are like 20 years later still easily still doing the the thing and discovering new things all the time you know i've talked on radios my entire career but somebody handed me a radio and told me what channel we were working on and it just worked and the back end of how radio works what it what it takes to get an, an fcc license the different sections of spectrum that get allocated for different purposes, how the repeaters are set up. All of this was new to me, but we started down this road. Uh, kudos to Dan Nutt, who is the uh, current president of the Washington State Maritime Cooperative Board, who said, you know, we need a little more resilience. We're sitting in an, in an earthquake-prone zone and we just uh, needs a little bit more backup and so that's how this this snowball got pushed off the top of the mountain and it's it's getting big as it rolls down and so i was super excited to find out about your involvement in amateur radio and communications because i really didn't know that you were so so involved tell let's start with mars what is uh, the military auxiliary radio service and how did you get to be involved with that organization? So, it, I mean, let me first start by saying, I, I can't believe you didn't know I was in the radio because you, uh, you opened that can and I can't stop talking about it. I think a lot of people are like that. Right. Um, so yeah, I think we're going to touch on a lot of different things. Um, so in my day job is, is, of course, the response group, emergency management, and all things, including requiring and requesting good communications. And just like you, I mean, I was in the Coast Guard. I, they handed me a radio, and it worked. And I, we expected things to work, and they did. But now we're look, looking at the back end and the nuts and bolts of it all, right, which is pretty fun. So I'm also um, a uh, volunteer because no Mars members are paid, but Mars is the Military Auxiliary Radio Service. And back in the day, and this goes uh, pretty far back, you know, uh, World War II, right around there where um, Air Force, Navy, and the Army had their own sections of Mars, and it became a, a morale service where if you had the radio men 24-7 uh, sitting at a desk on radios and they had downtime, then they could pass personal messages. And not only pass personal messages, but then make phone patches. And so using the high-frequency radio systems, 
be able to connect to a phone system. Back in the old days, we called it POTS, right? The plain old telephone service. Um, and be able to, wherever a plane was, a boat was, or a foreign serving person, uh, connect them to their loved ones and, uh, you know, hear their baby being born or say hi to their mom and dad or, you know, things like that. Um, well, and it became hugely popular during the Vietnam War. And, um, you know, there's, there's just no one then, of course, in the, the nowadays have, uh, we have cell phones, we have email and internet, none of that existed. And so you had poor Muldoons in the field who, you know, this was a way to be able to connect to wife, family, kids, loved ones. You know, I actually made a call. I had no idea it was it was Mars, but when I was on the Coast Guard Cutter Midget, bouncing around on the Bering Sea, I remember going down. Um, it was actually to the Gunner's Shack, and somebody here had a rate. They were doing phone patches, and I, I did. That must have been part of Mars. Yep. And I just I, was. I didn't realize it, but I probably talked to the family. Uh, three or four times over the course of a 90-day deployment because we had uh, a Mars operator who I actually think in his day job was a gunner's mate, mm. uh, one in five well, matches at night. Yeah, and back then, and I believe it or not, folks, I was on the midget as well, um, post-RAM. So, you know, Dan and I have... Um, We've been around the block, and now the, the the that midget that that version of midget is gone. Um, but probably it was in the gunner shack because radio was a secure space, and so people coming and going, they just fed you know a couple wires up to a different space to be able to to have people talk. Um, but Mars has been repurposed because now everyone, not everyone, but they're quite ubiquitous, cell phones and email, being able to talk and chat and do Zoom with the family and everything like that. So uh, Army Mars and Air Force Mars, Navy Mars actually uh, was disbanded. Um, in, I think 2009, I think Navy disbanded theirs. Uh, but they're starting to rethink that because uh, digital... Everything digital is suspect. And so the military is starting to think high frequency radio again after a long hiatus. Um, so, so there's the repurposing is that we've been um, reformed into uh, what, what generally are the uh, federal regions of the country. And so my wing 10 is region 10. And, and then my group is the state of Alaska. And how much of your time does operating with Mars take up? Uh, you know, it's usually as a as a basic member. And, and you asked, how do you get into it? Now, I'll discuss that if anyone has interest, in, you know, a little bit later. But uh, as a basic member, it's uh, getting your system to work and and get it put together and then be able to participate in nets uh, networking communications tests and and practice things like that so early on in a basic user it's it's not a lot of time i'd say several hours a week if that you know if you just want to you know learn and get into it um as the state commander then of course i have a lot of uh, overhead that has to happen and the you know the herding of cats uh, but also i am the special operations group um which is a sub part of mars and i am qualified and trained and now uh communicate with planes and so i communicate with air force aircraft um, essentially all over the world from here in this shack in Alaska. Well, what does your antenna look like? Uh, I have a 60-foot tower that I put up, and the antenna is a Step IR urban beam. And so it's, it, it, it's both a dipole and a Yagi, depending on the frequencies that I dial in, but it's a rotatable beam. 
So it looks like a big bow tie in the sky, about 60 feet up. Um, but also I have wires, I have a magnetic loop, I you know, have a bunch of kind of experimental stuff happening. So you've invested pretty heavily in your hobby. Don't ask how much. And, you know, as when you are a volunteer to Air Force Mars, um, the pay goes along with it. You know, you don't get a thing for it. Everything is is all um, you you pay for it all yourself. You don't get any government support or money for that. Does Mars represent any backup emergency communications for the Air Force or is it really just family support? Completely. It, it, it's everything from a uh, zombie apocalypse right down to uh, I listened to a phone patch of one of my East Coasters while he was on. He picked up a plane who was entering um, the airspace on the East Coast from Europe and he wanted to phone patch to his mom and dad. And I'm listening in and he goes, Mom, in 15 minutes, go outside and look up. I'm passing over the house. <laughs> That's awesome. So it's pretty cool, you know, to be able to make that connection. This poor guy, um, you know, he has duty. We we phone patch a lot of things. Um, you know, poor poor folks, they're they're out there and they're they're you know they're protecting the country and and doing long hard hours and service. And life doesn't stop. The wives are having babies. Um, you know, people are, are coming and going in this life, and we're helping make those connections. Um, and up and including then um, in-flight emergencies and things like that. So they can reach out to us, and we're there 24-7 for, for them for high-frequency radio communications. How does this hobby dovetail into your full-time emergency response job how do you view radio communications for emergency response as opposed to what we've all come to rely on which is our cell phone which i want to point out to everybody who's forgotten it is a radio true story and, and in many cases it plain just won't work um, especially if everyone goes to an oil spill and it's big, guess what? They're all using this. They're all using large data um, and it's going to kill, kill the service. So um, what I expect is layers of communication. We shouldn't all, always uh, expect a cell phone to work Except expect that to be the only thing. I want a backup plan, and I want a plan C as well, usually. Yeah, I remember a couple experiences. One was in Bellingham when the Olympic pipeline had its uh, fire. And no infrastructure was damaged in that event. But there was, but Whatcom Creek uh, burned, and there was... Uh, big black smoke plume going up in the air, 5,000 feet. And everybody who was in re visual range of that smoke plume got on their phone. Now, this is a while ago, and so the infrastructure wasn't as robust as it likely is to today. But we're also moving a lot more data than today than we were then as well. You couldn't make a call for like three days. It was like impossible to make a call. You sit there and dial and dial and dial, and maybe every sixth or seventh time you try, you might get a connection, and it might last for two or three minutes. Or I was no. down in southern Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina, where infrastructure had been damaged. And sometimes I could see a signal on the phone, but it still wouldn't connect. And maybe if it was two o'clock in the morning and I went up on top of the pilot house on the ship and I stood on one foot and put my hand in the air, you know, it might connect and then it might last for like five minutes, but it was not reliable. Right. Well, and like you said, a cell phone is a radio, just like handheld radios that, you know, we, we think of, but size matters, right? It, 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 the taller you are, the better you're going to reach out. Um, and so not only with, um, with, and cell phones are very, very high frequency data, 
um, where you know the the other frequency radio systems seems to work a little bit better and, and and are more robust. And then you can truncate a lot of the usage too. So they will just work. Um, that said, there's a system within the government. I don't mean to rub this in, but it's called a gets card. And it, it's an emergency card issued to, I happen to have one where it'll actually bump people off a cell tower in order to make an official call. So, you know, if something happens in the state, you know, and, it, and it's, uh, you know, here, I'm not worried about zombies. I'm not worried about uh, missile EMP necessarily. I am worried about earthquakes. I'm worried about uh, direct solar flare. Um yeah, the volcano eruption, things like that. Nat natural, we live on the Pacific Rim. It's natural disaster prone. And so there's a program, a process, if the cell phones are up and running, that you can bump people off in order to make official calls. Yeah, I had so, a guest card when I was at Clean Sound and MSRC, and I've actually, uh, uh, the executive director of, of WISMIC is working through the process to get the Washington State Maritime Cooperative into the GETS program. We, we, we haven't been up to now, but we will be within the next month or two. Cool. And you're right. We're sitting here uh, with the Cascadia Fault just off of the coast of Washington, Oregon. That earthquake, that fault slips about every 300 years, and it's something like 150 years overdue. And it's estimated when it goes, it'll be between a 9.2 and a 9.4 on the Richter scale. And yeah. that it's going to basically destroy infrastructure in Washington State west of I-5. A combination of the earthquake itself plus the follow-on tsunami. Coastal regions like Coos Bay, Reedsport, Grays Harbor, you know, these areas, Willapa Bay, they are going to be disaster zones from the tsunami. And you can see down at Shore Acres in Oregon where the uh, pieces of the, of the plates are actually sticking out of the shoreline like teeth from the last uh, uh, earthquake. And it's a big... It's a big thing. But then there's also the fault running up Admiralty Inlet. There's a fault running underneath Seattle. So, yes, zombies are an issue. <laughs> we all have our baseball bat with the nails sticking out of it for the zombies. Uh, but I would glue that vase down behind you. Oh, yeah, yeah. That would be a good idea. Yeah. So that said, um, you know, and part of the conversation we're talking going into high frequency radio communications that's what mars does but your question is how does this translate into my day job and what do i expect during spill response well yes everyone still does use a smartphone remember back in the day you showed up at an oil spill they would take your smartphone away from you and they said no because you can take a picture because you can get on you know Facebook and do whatever. Now it, it's actually required to have because it becomes a badge scanning device. You're in the field and you're doing dictation to your 214A personal log, things like that. Um, but line of sight VHF and UHF handheld communication works great. Um, and, and think of it this way that every incident starts local, every incident starts small. And handheld communication works, line of sight, point to point. And then if you have a repeater system that's a little bit higher, it extends the range of that network. That's, that works pretty well. Yeah, we are, we, WISMIC, has embarked on getting a FCC radio license. It's pending before the FCC right now. We're getting licensed for... Uh, 454 megahertz and 459 megahertz, which are the frequencies that Marine Spill Response Corporation's repeaters operate on here in the Puget Sound. So they've got a repeater on Buck Mountain, repeater on Constitution, and a repeater out by Nia Bay at Bohicas Peak. But 
to extend that, the uh, WCMRC in Canada also has repeaters, and they're working on the same frequencies as well. And these repeaters are going digital this year. Bohicas Peak already is, mm -hmm. and Constitution and Buck Mountain will be before the end of calendar year 2022. And so we'll be able to have two options when using those repeaters. We'll be able to uh, key the repeater locally, so it'll just retransmit out that repeater, or you'll be able to key that repeater wide area, and it'll transmit it every repeater all the way to Prince Rupert up by Ketchikan, right? which is going to be great, even for WISMIC, because we have a mutual aid agreement with WCMRC for response in the Straits of Juan de Fuca. So being able to get on that network will be be really important. And I think our contribution might be to add a repeater to that network out in Grays Harbor. So we'll put mm -hmm. a repeater out there on the same frequencies. And then I'm looking at digital hotspots. Have you done anything with digital hotspots? Yeah, there there are a few different things you can do with all that. Um, there, there's an interesting system, and it's by Aredin, A-R-E-D-N. Um, it's an internet mesh system, and it's made for emergency communications. Um, and so what it does is it, if the internet goes down, then this mesh network becomes an intranet, really. Um, and it's Aredin, A-R-E-D-N. That's kind of interesting. Have you done anything with it? Have you set up a network with it? I have two antennas right now. They aren't up yet. Um, so what you have to do is you have to, and I have a 2.4 and a 5, so I have a couple different uh, frequencies. They're, they're still at the gigahertz level. But what you have to do is actually flash the commercial software off it in order to get the new stuff in it. And uh, in radio, it, radio is a thousand hobbies. And so I haven't quite gotten to that yet. And I've got a, a Raspberry Pi sitting over on a shelf, and I'm intending to try to turn it into a, a hotspot. And of course, I've had it sitting there for a month and haven't touched it yet. But yeah, there's, and they say that that radio is the hobby of a thousand hobbies, and it it you've got to really pick something. Otherwise, if you're if you're broad spectrum trying to get to learn everything about radio there's no way because you really do have to deep dive and you have to take things apart and fix them and you have to understand the frequencies and the allocations and so you really have to sort of focus and my focus has been emergency communications based on my my background so in addition to mars there are two other different emergency radio groups within amateur radio right we have aries yep. and we have races can you talk about uh, a little about both of those yeah there so it's layers the onion really is you have basic single users and they're ham radio operators it's fcc licensed there are three levels of licensing you go through in order to get um more capability based on you know bandwidth so you've you've entered as a technician uh i'm a general and then the the upper the the highest level is called extra amateur extra um a lot of a lot of theory in that one i'm studying for that one but what those do then is give you um more transmitting capability and so as you learn in the intro through technician and through then the general which gives you a lot more high frequency technician is pretty much two meter and uh and 70 centimeter right so you know handheld stuff the 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 type the frequencies you're talking about and then you learn from that uh and then you can get some distance so hf then you can talk around the world so what happens with in so it's an acronym a rich environment and ARE. So ARES then is the civilian grouping of emergency management radio. 
And it's administered through the ARRL, the Amateur Radio Relay League. And that's what ARIES is. And so based on uh, people who want to learn about emergency communications, use their radio setup for the eventuality of any emergency, uh, then they can learn how to do that. And that's the amateur side. RACES then is the government organization of emergency radio service. And so it's your emergency operations centers, your sheriff's departments, uh, things like that. That's RACES, but, but it's local government stuff. There's another organization that you didn't mention, and it's called SHARES. S-H-A-R-E-S, and it's shared resources, and that's the federal side then of high-frequency radio service that all the different agencies have, so then they can intercoordinate. Um, we, <laughs> I won't even make jokes about the government and how we swear they can't talk to each other, but there is a program, and we do, and then Mars is is by being a member of Mars, I'm a member of shares. So the federal government then is together. And then the local governments through the state and the county generally are races. And then Aries, that's the civilian side. So I see Aries listed as a resource in the Northwest Area Contingency Plan. It's listed in the communications of uh, manual section 9501 i have never seen amateur radio folks at an oil spill exercise or at an oil spill i've never seen it happen have you seen it happen no it's usually more the um natural disaster type stuff that they're mobilized the aries the races the shared shares um at oil spills it's usually the they're professionals from the responsible party it's a it's a program and it's a process all already set together um they already have you already have the frequencies you already have a radio bank that you you drive over um i've seen eocs manned by uh by volunteers but washington, not in the field yeah washington state does have a whole area of the emergency operation center at camp murray that's set aside for aries folks and they do go in and, and man it mm -hmm. and the northwoods area contingency plan does refer to that resource for oil spill response, it's just never been used. And I was mulling around the idea of trying to roll them into this major equipment exercise I'm going to do in Grays Harbor in June um, as I start to get tie tied into that. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that once they're there, as trained radio operators, they don't necessarily just have to speak on a ham radio frequency. I, I've got a licensed frequency in the uh, uh, petroleum frequency allocation. They can speak on that, right? You bet. They can speak you on bet. my gear, right? They don't need to hack necessarily have their gear. Correct. And probably a little better trained than a lot of people and understand that you know, radios are, um, you know, it's a it's a, a push-pull system. It's not you both talk at the same time. A lot of people don't get that. No, no, a lot of people don't. So what do you think? Should I try to in, in expand this network and involve these kinds of folks? You think that's oh, right? I bet I bet they would dig it. Yeah, there's a lot of activity going on down there with radio. Um, you know, I wouldn't say there isn't up here. It's just this is the Alaska is a lot more sparse um, when it comes to population than than what you have down there. Well, and real estate, you got to go a long ways. That's a lot of repeaters. Like if you wanted to talk to Valdez between that Anchorage, that's a bunch of repeaters. Yeah, I was just watching a a video this morning from the. 
amateur radio club, I think in Skagit County, and they were talking about 220 megahertz. And there is a series of about eight repeaters that this group has put up across western Washington, all all working on, on 220. My radio won't transmit huh. on 220. It's, uh, what is it? Uh, here's one of us, 223.18, 222.62. So a whole series of repeaters in that, in that, was that the 1.25 uh, band? Interesting. I have a couple of radios that can do that. Um, I don't use that frequency at all. It, 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 so, I mean, the VHF and the UHF is uh, short range type line of sight communications, right? Um, when you get into the type of stuff I'm talking about, you're talking about um, region, out of region, global type communications as well. Yeah, I was uh, I was able to transmit this this handheld will go as high as eight watts. And for those yep. of you who have their cell phone in their pocket, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's about 0.4 watts uh, on average. Although I remember my first bag cell phone, it looked like a looked like a day planner and it had an <laughs> actual uh, telephone handset, and you just uh, tip the antenna up. That radio it was a Motorola. That radio transmitted at five watts. And I remember I'd be, I'd be out on the ship I was sailing, coastal freighters at the time, and I could make a call going into Kodiak from about a hundred miles out with that mm -hmm. with that cell phone. You can't you can't do that today. But uh, low no, well, if you're near water, that's a great ground plane, and you can get a lot more distance with whatever radio system you're using if you're near water. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it's interesting. When you get into high-frequency radio systems, generally the radios off the shelf are 100 watts. And then with amplifiers, my amplifier will boost that to 1,800 watts. That's the sort of stuff that I'm pushing. And what, are, what does the FCC allow? How high can you go? 1,500 in the United States. Okay. But as a Mars exemption, because Mars frequencies are off the ham bands, where I'm off the fringes, you don't even know what those frequencies are. They're they're not within the amateur band, and that we have exemptions, and we can go you know as much as you want, two thousand, three thousand, if you want. Wow, what bandwidth are you pushing? Is it twelve point five? Is it? It's yeah, it's narrow. Narrow, okay. Yeah. So interesting. So I was able yesterday. I was testing. Uh, my ability to uh, key a uh, repeater in the Puget Sound area, and I was able to do about 70 miles uh, just at sea level off the freeway with uh, handheld pushing 8 watts. That's super good. And that's a measure of where the repeater is. The, the repeater is a net, right? And so it's catching these frequencies and the higher you can put it up, the, the further away these users can be from it. Yeah, this particular repeater on Buck Mountain, I think is at 3,500 feet. So it's got Jeez, pretty, that's pretty not bad. good height of eye. I was actually uh, thinking uh, there's, a, there's a, a hilltop over here. You have to go up a logging road to get to it, but it, that's at about 3,500 feet, not that far from where I'm at in Vancouver, Washington. I was thinking of driving up there and seeing if at that height of I, I the handheld could still hit that repeater. It'd be about 150 miles. Yeah. But I am curious. Yeah, I don't know if that amount of power would go that far. It would be fun to see. And radio is interesting because today it may work, tomorrow it may not. And the next day, it may again. It is all based on conditions. Now, line of sight is a little bit more uh, forgiving. You you generally, if it's going to work, it's going to work because you, you have that line of sight. But when you're talking high frequency radio, you're talking the conditions of the ionosphere. And, that, and there are so many variables. 
primarily that of the sun. The activity of the sun exciting the ionosphere makes the world a difference for radio. What would be your recommendation for outside of emergency response? Just the the average citizen. Should everybody have a radio? Should we all learn how to use radios? Or is the average person just fine with their cell phone? Um, it, it is interesting. Um, I think that the, I'd love to see more people involved in radio. I think that, that the hobby would grow, that it would push development of new things. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of people are, they're playing, playing fine with their smarty pants phone and their, their internet at home. And they're good with that. But the people who are, <laughs> uh planning for the zombie apocalypse they go buy their 25 dollar uh bofang radio off of amazon you know one right here and stick it in their bag um i mean it's one thing to be able to transmit it's another thing to know which frequency you're on and who you're going to talk to yeah it's interesting you mentioned that because and i didn't know if we were going to go there but you know that you go to preppers pages and you know i'm sort of an outside uh, uh observer to that sort of thing but they have a band plan uh, called 333 i think it's called and it you know that it is if if everything goes to hell in a handbasket and you had this sort of radio what frequency are you going to be on when do you actually listen and call to see if anyone else is out there and you know it's kind of an interesting band plan and so a lot of the prepper folks have that into their into their $25 bowfangs i will say that anyone can buy and own radios and listen at will that's not against the law at all when you push that button that's where the license kicks in and so when you choose to transmit then you're actually should and and need to be licensed otherwise you can get uh, in quite a bit of trouble i was thinking of getting a, a, an hf rig to to listen and get it set up and get an antenna uh, and then have it all poised for the day that i pass my general license test and i think that'd be great i did and that, that really is, it's an impetus to get you to study, to think about, hey, what, what is it that I'll be able to do when I actually get there? And it, it's a lot of fun. I, and radio is all about listening anyway. Every, every pro, it isn't all about just getting on and, you know, hammer down and just rag chew over on and on and on. It's listening. And, and that's what they teach you is listen, listen, listen. So what do you, I just discovered this thing the other day called uh, software defined radio. Is that what it is? Defined. It is. Radio? Yep. SDR. SDR looks super fascinating. Have you done anything with it? And so for those, uh, so there's day, one right there. See that screen? Yes, I see it. So what that is, and that's slaving off of that radio right there. So it is a, a software-defined radio. And so in essence, back in the day and still today, I still have a, a Drake system here, which is tubes, no transistors at all. Oh, um, you're going to be able to use it after the EMP. I will. Okay. Uh, well, um, yeah, a lot of a lot of the Mars guys have a, we call them legacy radios, or others call them boat anchors. But um, yeah, it'll work. It, it will work no matter what. Um, so a software defined radio, unlike the older legacy radios, which are more crystal based. So if you had a crystal based radio, or even one that had a VFO, a, a variable. Uh, frequency that you're you're on one frequency at a time until you change it and then you're on another what an sdr a software defined radio does it samples all the bandwidth and then potentially you can even see on a waterfall where <coughs> pardon me 
if you're not on that frequency, you can actually see another uh, transmission and be able to then veer over to it and, and listen to it then. And it's interesting because it's a skill to be able to look at a certain transmission and see it and go, oh, that's a digital transmission. Oh, that's a verbal transmission. I'm going to go listen to that. And you can actually see that. And it's not just seeing radio, right? You can see the transmission coming off of your Wi-Fi network, off of phones, off of, I mean, you can, all sorts of sadly are putting out uh, RF, right? And you can see all of that. Sadly, you can, and sadly, you can hear it too, and it really degrades your radio performance. So, you know, when when it comes to having a shack and different radios and different frequencies, you really have to worry about RF. Not only the RF you're putting out, but the RF that's coming in and be able to separate things out. So that's where you get into toroidal magnets and you start wrapping cables and things in order to, you know, keep RF separated. So another piece of the, another hobby of the thousand hobbies isolating this gear from outside interference yeah because it's all about trying to get it quiet so you can hear something far away that's very you know very meek so these software defined radios i see that you can get them that are receive only and there are some that will actually allow you to transmit what are you using right uh i have what the the radio company is called flex and it's a flex 6400 so it is both it It'll, it'll listen on two different slices of frequencies and then transmit on whichever I choose. It's the Flex. What is it? What's the name? 6400. I'm making a, I'm making a note. Yeah, Flex is, um, is a pretty cool company for software-defined radios. I, everybody makes one now, whether it's a Yezu or a Kenwood or an ICOM. Um, they, they ha- now have waterfall SDR type, you know, uh, desk units, um, the flex it, it's a really a computer inside that box doing, doing all that good company. It's my second flex radio. Okay. That's cool. I was, looking but at I have you- a several icons. I have a Kenwood and then the old Drake or the Drake system that I have too. those that's circa 72. Do you have any words of advice for someone who's just becoming interested in radio? You know, it's funny because uh, usually it, back in the day, there were a lot more people doing this. And it usually had to do with guys coming back from the war. And so they they came back from World War II. They were radio operators. And then TV hit. And so then they started taking TVs apart and making radios. And that's back when you could do that kind of thing. Now it's, um, you know, to the the transmissions are too spurious. You just can't can't do the things that nowadays that you could back then. But, you know, those those days are gone and a lot of those folks are gone or going away. And so that that is bad for uh, the hobby because. The the old guy, we call him Elmer in the bills business, an older guy who you can just go over to his house and watch what he's doing and see his stuff. And, and he kind of shows you the ropes. That's an Elmer. And, you know, those are few and far between anymore. If uh, anyone's interested in radio, I suggest that, you know, they do some research. The technician license test is not that hard. You do have to study but it the it it's a little bit about everything the technician is to show you the importance of understanding that hey you can interfere with other people if you're not careful and that that's really the intro level is just getting you to be careful i was scared to death to talk when i got my technician level i just listened 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 and i and you know then i put my toe out there and you know, everyone's usually pretty, um, pretty helpful. Um, there, you know, there aren't a bunch of meanies out there in this in this field. But yeah, get your toe in the water and get started. It is about stuff. 
and uh, some of this stuff it doesn't have to be expensive um a lot of the the one of the thousand hobbies of radio is making your own stuff so people make antennas out of wooden sticks and wire and you know if it fits the physics it works well when we first started talking about adding emergency radio components to gear bag or the the tool kit of the Washington State Maritime Cooperative. <coughs> I had several technician, ham radio technicians in my incident commander corps. It's like, oh, that's cool. And so I went down the road and I got my technician's license and stuff. And then it was only after studying for the technician license realizing, well, I can't use that for this. Right. It's amateur radio. I can't use it. Yeah. This, right. Yeah. So the under Title 47 is really where all this comes from. And the where all us ham radio operators are allowed to operate uh, under very stringent uh, conditions. And one of them is that we can't make money. We can't do third party stuff, um, things like that. But the reason that it exists is to be ready in case in an emergency it's necessary. Um, and, and so a lot of the people, a lot of the discussions you hear on the radio are very simple. It's, hey, who you are, what the weather is, what your radio setup is, and what the, the signal report is. And they move on. Others, they'll, they'll sit and talk about a brownie recipe, you know. Or, or, you know, it just depends what you're into. I, I realize that really for day to day uh, well, preparedness, a commercial license was what was appropriate. And we uh, applied through a coordination um, uh, company to get on the, the general industry uh, frequencies for oil spill response. Yeah. But I think amateur radio still has a role in this. You, you talk about having plan A, plan B, and plan C. And I think we're still going to put a, a BHF, UHF rig capable of transmitting and receiving on the amateur bands in the comm center at the Marine Exchange of, of Puget Sound. When you are talking about oil spills, it is a commercial commercial venture. And so there are... There are uh, professional services and professional um, frequencies that you would operate, not necessarily on the hand bands. Does the response group have any radio capabilities? No, we don't. We don't carry radios. We're computer, computer and internet, and um, that's the information information servicing that we do. Yeah, we re we rely on Marine Spill Response Corporation to provide internet connectivity in the field and and radios and they 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 spend a lot of time energy and money to make sure that system is appropriate the gap i was trying to fill you know it a certain way down the road hour four hour five they'll hand me a radio that i can use so i don't even need my own i don't even need the license but it's that initial piece where hey something's happened and my cell phone doesn't work and i need to connect with people uh to get that ball roll like that's the gap i'm trying to fill anything else you want to say before we wrap this up pete that's we go way back man this is a lot of fun you know it's a small world um just try communicating uh you know across it when the conditions are bad and you just dis discover it's a pretty big place a big place indeed pete Thanks so much for taking the time to come on the program. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Tactics Meeting. I hope you enjoyed the program. Maybe it will inspire you to go get your ham radio license, technician or general license. Get a, get a radio, develop a communications plan for you and your family, or expand your response organization's capabilities beyond the use of cell phones. If you liked the program, go to Amazon or Apple and give us a like. And if you've got an idea for the program, you've got a guest that you'd like to hear from, you want to be a guest yourself, you can email me. The email address is podcast at thetacticsmeeting.online. Take care. Be safe.